Welcome to Community Matters on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the House committee that blocked the direct filing expansion and uh, other fiscal problems that have resulted from the platform points, the ideology, and the legislative moves of the GOP. Our guest for the show is Roger Epstein, president of the Maitreya Institute. Welcome to the show, Roger. Thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. You are a terrific uh, community citizen and anything I can do to help, I'm glad to be here. Let me uh, also say something about myself here. In addition to being president of the Maitreya Institute, which is a 40 year old uh, organization uh, set up to uh, provide education and, and programs on art healing and spirituality in all cultures, I also started my career in 1967 as an internal revenue agent, worked five years for the IRS uh, local office in DC and uh, national office, uh, two and a half years each, and then moved after five years to Hawaii, where I became the head of the tax department at our largest law firm uh, for 45 years. And, uh, Having retired from that in 2016, still have my finger in both uh, uh, the, the spiritual world. Maitreya means it's a Tibetan Buddhist word for loving kindness. And a, a Tibetan Buddhist nun says that means being your own best friend. And also in this tax world and corporate business world where I was a international corporate tax lawyer for 55 years. So... I want to comment from both sides of that uh, in our talk today. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask you how you live with yourself, but I guess I already know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what this committee is doing and why in the world would they cut back or force the IRS to cut back on a program that clearly benefits, um, you know, middle class and disadvantaged taxpayers? Why do that? You know, I think it's all part of the program to uh, just cut back on taxes, uh, which I could, uh, in a, what I consider to be an irresponsible manner, uh, coupled with the understanding that you cannot get elected today unless the big money corporations are sponsoring you. And one of the big money corporations are the industry uh, to uh, file tax returns. And so having a program where you can bypass them has caused them to spend hundreds of, uh, I, I think the number is somewhere 93 million uh, in lobbying efforts to knock out this program that's benefited, uh, I think uh, you said 140,000 people. Uh, which uh, is a, not a small number when you consider that uh, they saved, uh, these are people who can't afford to pay and who saved uh, five, $10 million in, in fees and uh, uh, brought in uh, the, you know, were able to file their taxes. So why they cut it out is one of the reasons uh, that they cut out so many things which is to uh, uh, help the people that pay for them to stay in office. This is an intersection, I think. It's an intersection of the ideology that drives, and the political ideology that, that drives the GOP to vote one way or another. And their whole thing is uh, let's skinny down government, let's make government services less available to people. So that, that's you know, the, the natural drift of everything they do. But the other part is that they're, it's pay for play. You have, yeah. uh, you have the tax preparation companies giving them millions of dollars in lobby money. And so, um, you know, there's a kind of corruption there. There's nobody on the other side saying, wait, you need to take care of the disadvantaged and middle class taxpayers. There's no organization. There's no business. Well, there, there are actually are organizations saying that, Jay, but they're not giving the kind of money Mm -hmm. that, the, that the corporates are. And unfortunately, you put your finger on the, the two big problems uh, 
behind the government, uh, the GOP concept for government today. And I, I, it's not something to, I'm not trying to be negative about the GOP. It's their philosophy. I just think it's very wrongheaded. And I believe that we should have a government, that there's need for government. I worked for the IRS long enough to know about inefficiencies. Uh, people go to work for the government in, in some cases because they don't work any, want to work any harder on the outside, or maybe they couldn't get a job on the outside. But I can tell you that there are a lot of dedicated people in the government who want to do the job. Uh, the IRS wants to be fair uh, and collect the taxes that are due. They're not an oppressive organization that wants to just beat up on people. Uh, when uh, more money is asked for to get a better enforcement, uh, uh, the GOP says, well, what are we throwing this money away? And uh, the enforcement is going to be on little people. That's just not the truth. Like any other organization that has intelligent people, uh, you want to spend your money where you get the most bang for your buck. And uh, more money is spent looking at, they have teams of people dedicated to uh, large audits on big corporations. And today, they don't have enough uh, manpower to enforce the laws, period. Is it more expensive to audit a big corporation than some you know, middle-class family? It is, Jay. It's more expensive. And I'll tell you why. First of all, uh, it's so much more complicated. There's so much more going on, so many more transactions than even a small business. Uh, an international business requires maybe two or three agents full time. Uh, uh, one of our big banks was a client of mine. And, and for years, the IRS actually had an office at the bank where they had a person there full time. Uh, uh, and that person would go through a cycle of auditing two years of their returns and then they would uh, switch and put somebody else on it so that they wouldn't get too connected or, you know, it was just a good idea to change after a while. But and the stakes are higher. The stakes are higher with the, of with the audit of a, of a multinational corporation. Of and course. if you find that they've been fooling around, um, the government wins big time. Uh, if, you exactly. don't, if you don't audit them, you don't get any of that. Exactly. Exactly, Jay. It costs more, but that's where you have so much more uh, to pick up. And let me let me tell you the philosophy. So I was with the IRS for five years, and I was in private practice uh, seriously for 45 years, and I'm retired, still have my finger in a few things. There is no requirement to pay more money than you owe in taxes. That's very clear. Judge Learned Hand made that statement in New York court uh, many years ago. And, and it may seem like it, but there's nothing in black and white about how you interpret the law. Every law, as you know, as a lawyer for uh, over 50 years, uh, can be looked at in a many different ways. And I remember, here's an example, Jay, of how complex the tax laws are, just starting out with accounting. When I was in accounting school, uh, one of the classes, that the, the, he put on 10, 20 transactions that happened during the year to this company, and you were supposed to calculate their net income. And the answers ranged under, under uh, tax principles. The answers ranged from zero to $20 million, and everybody was right. Very scary. Yeah. So as a practitioner, what I would do is uh, look at the situation and determine what was the best way for my client to minimize their taxes. I would look at a scale of uh, 
one to a hundred, what percent did I think we were in terms of uh, uh, correct? If it, if it said there are some things that are explicitly allowed, you have a maximum uh, of deductions in this area. It's clear that's all you can do, but most things are gray. So in the tax law, the first rule for people who are legitimate is that you can't claim anything on your return where you don't have substantial authority. That's the first buzzword. Substantial authority roughly means you think you have one chances out of three that you'll win if you go to court. So there's two thirds that you won't win, mm. but you can put it on your tax return without being penalized if you get caught and corrected, okay? You may win because you have a one third chance. All right, the second standard is more likely than not. And, and that means you believe as a practitioner, and of course, just still just your opinion, that your client has better than a 50-50 chance of winning. Now, those are the standards that are utilized. So think about that. If I'm a practitioner and I'm telling my client, we can do this, we're, we're permitted, you can put it on your tax return, you have a one-third chance of winning. Or for other, in other situations, I've got to tell you, you I've got to get to 50-50, which again is my opinion. Okay, that means that when the government comes in, in one case, they have a two thirds chance of turning around whatever you did. And in the bet, not the best case, but in the, uh, the typical case, you'll have a 50 50 chance. So you can see if the company has $2 billion in revenue and the tax rate, well, it used to be that it's 21% now, and, and uh, they can calculate their income at $200 million, then uh, uh, 20% of that is $40 million. Uh, uh, half of that could be wrong. Over your lifetime of tax practice, things have changed, of course. There have been changes to the Internal Revenue Code. There have been changes to the way Internal Revenue agents operate. And there have been changes in the way taxpayers operate. And I, I'd like to ask you a question, which, you know, you must have seen this happening. The attitudes of taxpayers, especially big taxpayers, big corporations, have changed since you started practicing in tax. Their, their attitude about those rules and the probabilities and can I get away with it have, have changed. Let me say this. Uh, I never represented anybody that wanted to break the law, okay? I wouldn't represent them. And I didn't find any companies where they really wanted to cheat. What they wanted to do was pay the minimum. And so the question to them was from me, if we take this position, how risk tolerant are you? In other words, if I say, we have substantial authority, but there's two thirds against us. Are you willing to do that? Because you'll have to pay tax. You won't have to pay a penalty, but you'll have to pay the tax and interest. And you'll have to come up with that money after you've already spent it on something else three years from now. So it's more of a how risk tolerant are you? Uh, and some people are very conservative. And unless I tell them it's more than 50-50 and maybe even higher, uh, they don't want to do it. Today, Jay, and, and with this gets back to our original point of underfunding the IRS. There are so many more companies willing to be uh, risk to take the risk and uh, not be worried that they're going to be caught and pay interest uh, and have to come up with the money later on uh, because they don't think they're going to get audited because the government's underfunded. And, and, and this gets back to uh, uh, the concept that Reagan put in 
in uh, 1980 and ongoing of uh, government isn't the answer, it's the problem. And the way we reduce government is by cutting back on uh, uh, its budget, how much money we take in, and we starve the beast. It's gotten so out of hand that it appears to some people in Congress, I think, that the IRS is the enemy. Even, even uh, uh, Reagan, when he lowered the taxes dramatically on individuals and corporations, he beefed up the Internal Revenue Service saying two things. One, uh, we want to make sure people are, are, not, are, are complying with the law. And secondly, now that the rates are lowered to 50 percent, then 35 percent, People won't cheat anymore. They won't be aggressive. They won't be assertive. They won't go out there and do things because the tax rates are low. And you know what? That was just wrong. And then, and then uh, Trump knocked them down to 21 percent, and now he wants to knock it down to 15 percent. And the idea is we don't need a government, not a government of the people, by the people, for the people. We don't need a government. And uh, that's just not true. Uh, we need a why, is, why do you say that? Can't we, we get along with all the, without all these agencies and all these government employees? That's what he's saying about the deep state, the administrative state. Um, do they not perform a function? Uh, could he be right? You know, I, I don't I, I go back to uh, historically before we had these uh, agencies. Uh, child labor laws, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commissions. How many frauds? There's so many frauds uh, and misrepresent. Without uh, uh, oversight uh, uh, of banks, of security issuance, uh, we've eliminated some things like antitrust laws. We don't believe in antitrust anymore. And so we're down to, I don't know how many companies, I saw something about the fabulous seven or something, but we, you know, I think we need government regulation for the reason I see it in my clients. Um, yes, people want to comply with the law, but on the other hand, uh, they want to do what will favor them. And without an independent uh, arbitrator, somebody to pull, blow the whistle when you've gone too far, uh, it, it would be totally out of control. It already is so dominated by the rich. Um, and what about what about the social programs, Roger? What about I mean, the do, social? Do, do we really need them? Why can't people go out there and get a job and work and earn a living and not take welfare? Uh, what is wrong with them? Wouldn't this force them to be more productive in the economy if you if you cut off all the social programs? That's what they're talking about doing. This is starving the beast. Yes, it is, Jay. And unfortunately, uh, the starvation is really hurting a lot of people. There's some recent statistics on how many people are working homeless. They have jobs. And after they work, they go home and sleep in their car uh, because they can't afford rent or a house. We've gotten so out of kilter uh, that it's ridiculous. And uh, uh, I think that without some kind of system, uh, the people who are in charge uh, will take advantage and do everything they can to make more money for themselves and give less to others. And I, I, I say that uh, because I think that's the state of, of where we are. And I, I told you earlier that I just went to Bhutan for a week uh, for a class involved, uh, uh, a conference called Reimagining Education. And their terminology is gross national happiness. And uh, in education, in business, and it's all about humans collaborating with each other, working together. 
but we've changed we've created a society <clears throat> where it isn't set up that way uh, people run running... no, it's getting worse it's get, it perpetuates itself for example if i have a super rich class the one percent if you will um owning you know an enormous percentage of the wealth in the country they protect themselves by lobbying they protect themselves by pay per play in congress um, exactly. And most recently, you have these guys in the tech industry uh, who are giving enormous amounts of money. Uh, Elon Musk, $45 million a year um, to support um, a month. Trump. And, and a month. A month. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. $45 million a month to support you know, his choice of political candidate. Uh, right. Thus, attempting to perpetuate his wealth and the wealth that goes into you know, forward generations. This is very troublesome, and it leads to it leads to perpetuating, exacerbating the situation you just described. How how do we compare with other countries? I mean, that direction is not a happy, you know, use your term, not a happy direction. But what about Europe? They have really good social programs, and they, they have, have be, they have better social programs. I mean, if you talk about happiness, the happiest countries in the in the world are Norway and Sweden and Denmark, where they have extremely high taxes and social programs for everybody. They have health insurance for everyone. They have uh, minimum wages. They have so many programs that ensure that the average person can have a decent life. Uh, we we change that. We believe in... Uh, 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 two weeks of vacation. Uh, we 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 believe you're supposed to work all the time and work hard. And what are what are we doing? And when I get back to the principles of Bhutanese gross national happiness, they're actually uh, about collaboration, about uh, cooperation, about being kind and decent. And all the things that we learned in Sunday school, but somehow in our society, we think they're irrelevant or bullshit. Uh, the school that immerses itself in gross national happiness in Bhutan is called Education for Lifelong Citizenship. What does it mean to be a good citizen? And... I think, frankly, we've gotten ourselves in such a bad mess in so many ways that it's going to take a whole new several generations. We're in a serious problem here because we have a failing middle class. We have people who sleep in their cars, as you mentioned, can't yeah. buy a home, can't live a reasonable life. And they look across the pond and they see people in Europe doing better and people in Asia doing better. Um, and this country is declining in, in the way of mm, happiness, in the way of having a, an economy that works for individuals. Now, I know that Joe Biden has done good things, but he has had a long way to go um, to try to reverse this trend. So, you know, you talk about how bad it is and how it probably is going to get worse. And the 1% the is going to work real hard to make it worse. What do we do, Roger? I started to go there in terms of, and this is a long-term plan, but it's something I brought back from Bhutan and I'm working uh, here to implement. We need to teach our children to be kind, to be collaborative, that humans do better when you work together. Uh, the United States is struggling because uh, we're a mature society. We have so much uh, reverence for independence and individual initiative that we've refused to put in the kind of social programs that they've done in Europe. Uh, we emphasize when people cheat on things. I mean, people cheat on everything. Corporations cheat on their taxes. They cheat on their uh, all their regulatory requirements. And individuals who are getting... Uh, uh, food stamps cheat on their food stamps, and they don't they don't dis disclose all their income because you can't live on it. 
I go back, there's two things that would, uh, if we really want to turn a system around, Jay, we would have to dramatically increase taxes and increase social service programs. Some of these programs like food stamps and welfare, there may be cheats, but we're keeping tens of millions of people, maybe more out of poverty, out of being out on the street. And, and uh, it's, it's, that's where your focus has to be on the positive side, not the negative side. So when I, left the, uh, when I started in 1967 as an internal revenue agent, the, the t- highest tax rate on individuals had just come down to 70% on all your income in excess of a, what today's dollars, a million dollars. And so there was money to pay for things to make the system work. Now, we may have uh, 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 not spent that money as wisely as we could, but we weren't short of everything. Hawaii is short a thousand teachers. What could be more important than educating your kids? Of course, our system is 200 years old and designed to for, create factory workers who can read and write a little bit and uh, to keep people in line so they won't overthrow the government. If we went back to taxing the rich and we had the money, we could do more social programs. There are things that work. We should do them. We should try to eliminate as much cheating as possible. But we ought to recognize that we still don't have everybody covered by, by health care. There's no reason why we should have people starving in the streets. You talk about things in decline, Jay. Or dying in the streets, you know. Or you dying in the streets. You know, when is that coming next, like in India? A lot of people are living good. We're doing nicely in many ways, but we're a mature society. We're not the same way we were after World War II, where we had everything and everybody else had nothing. So we have to recognize that. A couple of points come out of this discussion for me, Roger. Yeah. Number one is um, we have to avoid abuse. We have to avoid waste because government you know, does include that. And yeah. how do you do that? You do that with good management. Good management has to come not only from the top, but from the administrative state. We have to insist on good management. Secondly, you know, the people in charge, like Congress and state legislators, have to be aware of these fiscal issues and they have to manage. Uh, In in many places, many organizations, including especially Congress, they don't know what you're talking about. They resist what you're talking about and they don't manage. And so, you know, the choices are really terrible. Jay, and Jay, uh, we don't we don't have people who are independent thinkers anymore, because you can't when you can't run for office unless you have an enormous amount of money, and the money is uh, we through uh, interpretations by the Supreme Court of what's acceptable and and constitutional in terms of capping money uh, given in the system. Uh, uh, the, the, the parties hand out the money, and unless you tow the line, you can't get elected. And your focus is on how to raise money and how to keep yourself in office instead of how to make our country a better place. And yeah. that, unfortunately, is the state of where we are. And it's not going to turn around. It, ha- it, it, it really started badly in the 80s. And so that's 45 years now. So it's not going to turn around overnight. But we do need to take some steps forward. And we need to uh, really revitalize our education system so it's focused on uh, lifelong uh, citizenship, education for how do we become, what responsibility do we have What did you learn in school about your responsibility to the country instead of how do I make more money and get a better job? This sounds like John F. Kennedy. Had he lived, we might have been in a whole different place. But we weren't ready for him. And he was murdered. And we went backwards. And, and, And we continue to go backwards until we get to a point where people are really willing to change. And I, I think uh, 
the idea of you don't pay any taxes, we keep lowering, nobody's res uh, it's ridiculous. Years ago, they talked about a tax system where everybody would pay 10% or 15%. Now, imagine you're making $50,000 a year with, uh, even by yourself, that's hard these days. But imagine you have a family and they want you to pay $5,000 out of your 50. You're just at the margin, even if it's 100. And then you're making a million dollars a year and they want you to pay 100,000. And you say, well, gee, the guy pay, making 50 is only paying five, I'm paying 100. Well, he's got $45,000 left that he can hardly buy food. And you've got $900,000 left where you can do whatever you want. And after you spend 200,000, you don't even know what to do with your 700 that's left over. That's called discretionary income. And that was the concept for graduated tax rates. And we, we, we just, but the simple idea, I've heard all kinds of people, not just rich people, poor people say, yeah, everybody should pay 10%. I gotta have some skin in the game. I'm in the game, whether I put money in or not. And I, 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 I pay other taxes, I pay real property taxes, I pay gross ec general excise tax. I don't make enough income, why should I pay the same uh, 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 proportionately, oh. it, it, it's it's simple-minded, uh, bad policy. Well, it's not decent. It's not caring. It do, it's not patriotic. It doesn't exactly. actually not allow for an improvement of life for everyone in the country. Let me ask you my Charles Dickens question, though, Roger. You remember the ghost of Christmas in the past? And, yes. Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge and all that in the Christmas story that Dickens wrote. There was the ghost of Christmas future, um, which terrified um, Ebenezer Scrooge and changed the way things work. And I think we have to appreciate what the ghost of Christmas future is. So I want to ask you, what is the ghost of Christmas future? If we do nothing, if we just let it carry on the way it is, everything being the same, the sort of static without any positive change or negative with negative change. What happens to us, the country and all of us? Well, if you look at the projection from 1980 to today, in terms of what what the average person can do, what they have, uh, uh, we're going to have, you know, double, triple the homeless. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, more people uh, uh, sleeping in their cars, more fewer people uh, uh, with health care. Uh, what I what I would take from that story, instead of me trying to predict the future, I would say this, and this comes from uh, uh, somebody that I uh, had the pleasure of setting up a foundation for and being on the board for many years, Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist. And he studied thousands of cultures. And one of the things he said was, in your darkest cave lies your greatest treasure. And I would say we've built ourselves a very dark cave. And we may need to get to a point where we're really willing to do something about it, Jay. And part of what I said about Bhutan and gross national happiness, we do need to educate kids for the future to believe that they have a responsibility for, for citizenship and to give them the tools <clears throat> to utilize their talents. Not everybody's supposed to be a lawyer or a doctor or a financial advisor. We had wood shop and metal shop when I was in school. Uh, we had a, a bank where you could learn uh, how to uh, be a teller in a bank and, and uh, we need we need kids getting hands on projects. And instead, we have less of it. We've given up. We don't have the money for uh, 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 P.E. or art or any of the other the other things. Uh, 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 Robert Kennedy has a wonderful speech in 1968 where he talks about society 60, almost 60 years ago, where he says, uh, we're so focused on material wealth. Uh, we have new cars. We have this. We have that. 
He said, and we're focused on everything except what's important in life. Relationships, uh, being a good person, uh, uh, caring, um, helping your neighbor, all these things, we're not doing it. I would look at uh, Ebenezer Scrooge and I would say, let's get worried. How deep do we have to go? How deep in our in our negativity do we have to get before we're going to do something dramatic to change? And I think in the short term, uh, we need to increase taxes and increase social programs, increase school and better education. And in the long term, we need to make that education uh, something about lifelong citizenship, education for being an American, being a good American who believes in government of the people, by the people, for the people, and not just the people running it. And uh, we have the most incredible history of any, co any country in, in history, changing from kings and nobility to, uh, with all its flaws, uh, the system we have. Uh, and now we've let it go really badly, as Benjamin Franklin worried, uh, can we keep our republic? Uh, but that doesn't mean that the future has to be bad. Uh, we just have to take the bull by the horns, take responsibility. One of the great things is that you and I and many kupuna are living longer. We have learned some wisdom, and we're not, uh, many of us, not in a position uh, of being so needy and greedy. And if we can pass that on to the kids and help them get educated into these principles, which are embodied in gross national happiness. I think the future will evolve into something better. And when I look at the history of humanity, I think we're a lot better off than when we were crucifying people 2000 years ago and <laughs> barbarism and, and, and hundreds of years ago when, when we thought that uh, the sun revolved around the earth and was the uh, earth was the center of everything. And so uh, I see an upward progression, and that in includes uh, uh, ups and downs. And in many ways, we're in a down. Uh, so the, the only way up after the, we hit the bottom, <laughs> wherever that is, is up. I think we have the possibility, the capability, and and I I, I think what you're trying to do and put on programs so more people get this kind of understanding, the better, Jay. So thank you. I agree, and I join you in your idealism and your willingness to spend time trying to make the world a better place, Roger. Kudos to you. And, you. and I am thinking of um, uh, Kennedy's comment, think not of what your country can do for you. Think of what you can do for your country. Roger Repstein, tax lawyer and idealist, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Aloha. Aloha.